Good morning. Uh, we're here today with Yaris Varoufakis, the mm -hmm. Professor of Economics at Athens, University of Athens. He is in the UK at the moment promoting his book, The Global Minotaur. Yaris, would you like to just give us a, the premise of what your book's actually about? It's an attempt to work out how we ended up in the mess we find ourselves in globally in Europe, in the UK, uh, and of course in the United States, because whether we like it or not, the United States of America is a, the main protagonist, has been since uh, 1944 or so, in shaping uh, the global capitalist economy. There are many competing uh, and quite interesting stories as to why we're in the crisis we, we find ourselves in at the moment. Uh, the, the, the favorite uh, scapegoat is the banking sector and there is much to be said about its uh, role in uh, bringing us into this mire. Uh, but there are many different stories that are being told from different perspectives, uh, different ideological points of view, some blame the private sector, some blame the government and so on and so forth. And I think that these are all partial truths but they don't tell a story which is cogent and coherent about what happened. So I try to, uh, to put together a story. And my story is very simple. My story is, uh, begins with uh, um, a hypothesis, which is not mine. The moment I explain what it is, you realize that it's, uh, it has a very time-honored uh, past and tradition behind it. Um, the hypothesis is that capitalism is uh, an extremely precarious um, mode of organizing economic life. It's a system which is capable of extremely fast and prodigious growth uh, during which periods of growth it produces masses of wealth and masses of poverty all bound up together uh, so it's um, a system that generates together with amazing technologies uh, incredible infrastructure goods and services enormous contradictions at the same time inequalities uh, and the gradient of pain and human deprivation, all wrapped up in one. Mm -hmm. um, this is not new, this is not what this book is about, but this book is about an amazing experiment that started in, after the war and uh, it featured as a main protagonist the United States of America. An amazing experiment at regulating capitalism, an experiment that produced the longest and uh, most persistent period of prosperity the first two decades after the war, which I call the global plan. It was a, it was a response to the great crisis of 1929. Um, the idea behind it was very simple. You cannot trust the markets. The markets gave us 1929, and then when 1929 took place, and finance collapsed, followed by all the other sectors, the markets were utterly incapable of uh, recovering, of rebooting, to use a more modern term. And it was a combination of the New Deal and the war uh, that uh, managed to tame the dragon of the mid war crisis. So in 1945, the United States of America took it upon itself to smoothen the path of capitalism, to rationalize it, to organize it globally, to give it some rhyme and reason, and to prevent uh, a new Great Depression from coming. I call this the global plan because the United States of America um, took it upon itself to sell more to the rest of the world than it was important to have services. But then, and that's the, the mark of a true hegemon, to take those services and send them back to where they came from uh, by supporting, massively supporting, the German a vital space in Europe, also called the European Union later, and of course Japan. Um, it was this combination of private property, private property of corporate uh, uh, finance and logic on the one hand, uh, but also of a central plan which was as uh, well and powerfully enforced and designed as the Soviet Union's was, mm -hmm. except that it was a, 
uh, an alliance led by the United States, States administration between the public and uh, monopoly capital. Now, of course, the best laid plans end up in ruins, and uh, this wonderful global plan was ruined by the fact that at some point the, the, the exorbitant privilege that the United States got from being the surplus recycling mechanism of the world and its currency being the world currency, uh, that they, they abuse that. They, they, they use this, this privilege in order to uh, effectively finance the wars, initially in Korea but primarily in Vietnam, and finance social programs without taxing the super rich. So we moved to the second phase. It, we had to move to the second phase. Nixon was, did not just act on a whim. Uh, what had happened was the surplus recycling mechanism that was instituted after the, first, after the Second World War could no longer be because it was predicated upon the surpluses of the United States of America. But once America had stopped having surpluses and had got into deficit, this me mechanism had to die. Mm -hmm. And the Americans were very quick in killing it off and replacing it with another surplus recycling mechanism, which was weirdly audacious. Uh, it was exactly the reverse. Instead of the United States being the surplus country, sending its surpluses abroad, it became the deficit country, attracting other people's surpluses to the United States. So the United States was uh, importing more than it was exporting, increasingly so, and on purpose. It was part of, you know, um, U.S. hegemony plan part B. Yeah. <laughs> Since we can't um, dominate by means of surpluses anymore, we'll dominate by means of deficits. And this is the beauty of it, because it's the first time, it's the first time in human history where an empire builds its power uh, through its capacity to regulate the world by means of its deficits. Now, I call this a global mind error, because uh, I, I don't think that a, a book with the title the, the global vacuum cleaning is <laughs> very attractive. And also, it doesn't capture the essence of it as nicely as the ancient Greek myth of the Minotaur, because uh, let me uh, remind those who've forgotten the uh, Greek mythology, and why should you remember it? Um, the story of the Minotaur was that it was a beast that lived in the basement of the powerful King Minos of Crete, at the time when Crete was the dominant force in the Aegean, in, in, in the global economy of the time. Yeah. And, uh, the rest of the states of Greece were sending tributes, regular tri tributes, to be devoured by the beast. Of course, those tributes were young men and women. Uh, and uh, th this constant flow of tributes from the rest of Greece to the powerful hegemon allowed, uh, allowed gave uh, uh, the opportunity to King Minos to maintain uh, peace and prosperity and trade throughout the region. Uh, so I was thinking that the, 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 the equivalent in, in, in our uh, era were the tributes of capital that were going from both Asia and, and Europe to New York uh, in order to finance the beast, the beast being between the United States, uh, so as to allow for the surplus society globally, which is necessary in order to keep capitalism going. The problem was that these capital inflows into New York uh, simply because they involve transfers of lots of money <laughs> to bankers, uh, they gave the bankers, which is natural and what you expect of them, I don't even blame them, uh, an incentive to find ways of uh, benefiting from those inflows that were going through their fingers. And those means and ways were was what we now know as financialization, financial engineering, and the toxic derivatives, all those means by which the financial system tried to uh, multiply its own riches from the flows of capital that were going through their books. Uh, and thus Wall Street, and in association with Wall Street, the city of London, uh, effectively minted mountains of private money. These pieces of paper ended up being the CBOs, the CBS and all that. And that huge quantity of private money, and we, we're talking about the situation where in 2004, 2005, for every dollar that was minted by the, the Fed, 
there were uh, equivalent of a hundred of dollars of private money minted by Goldman Sachs and by Lehman Brothers and by the Royal Bank of Scotland and the Bank of America and so on and so forth. World capitalists became addicted to all this private money, but when you have an ATM in, in, inside the banker's living room and they can simply help themselves to it, then they keep doing it a, a little bit too much. And at some point, you know, you just get over, overwhelmed by the quantity of the paper money that you're creating and that paper money simply burns. And this is what 2008 was. And the tragedy, this is the end of how the, the story ends in my book, is that this debt crisis, private debt and public debt crisis, which was created as a result of the burning down of the private money that uh, Wall Street and the city of London have created, uh, the credit crunch of 2008, effectively killed all the money. And what do I mean by this? The capacity of the United States to recycle the world's surpluses using Wall Street died. So now we have a situation where we have a glut of savings, not just in China uh, and the East, but also in Europe and the United States in the private sector. We have a glut of savings. They don't have anywhere to go because there are, uh, investors are too coy about investing at a time of depression. And this one, we have, we have a depression, whether we like it or not. And you have, on the other side, huge debts and deficits. And the two cannot be brought together and and, and put to, to good use. Yeah. So the capacity of capitalism to recycle uh, surpluses in the form of productive investment uh, has been killed off. This is the book by Professor Yanis Varoufakis, The Global Minotaur. Um, if you can take the opportunity to do, so, uh, to do so, take the time to read it. I think you'll find it very illuminating. We hope that um, you found the conversation with Yanis today interesting, with some food for thought. It certainly has done for us. Yeah. We'd so like to thank Yanis for taking the time out of his incredibly busy schedule here in London. Well, it's incredibly pleasurable to be in the context of a trade union uh, uh, setup. Excellent. Thank you very much, Yanis. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.